We're talking in broad terms now in this next lecture about the Anabaptist movement and how it spun out into a few very dangerous and violent sort of expressions. Um, it, it began with this movement known as uh, well, the, the Melchorites, and this guy named John Mathis. A traveling preacher named uh, Bernard Rothman, who was influenced by Luther and some of the other reformers, he came to the city of Munster in sort of northern Germany. And he gained a very large audience by his good preaching, by his holy lifestyle. Uh, before long, there were excited crowds that listened to him. And he attacked the church and he destroyed the images in the church and in the church itself very much along the lines of these sort of radical reformation. His name was Bernard Rothman. Now the Bishop of Munster, who was also like the mayor, he gathered some troops loyal to him to put down the disorder. But the political leader of the area, who was Philip, the Landgraf, or like the Lord of Essen, he intervened and he declared Munster to be a Protestant, or they would say in German, an evangelical city. So Munster, the city, was established as a Protestant city, a place friendly to Protestants, and it instantly became a magnet of all sorts of persecuted peoples from around the region. And they were people of two kinds. Some of them were godly people, some of them were crazy people. Some of them were immigrants. And these immigrants, exactly from Holland, convinced Rothman that infant baptism was unscriptural and he took that opinion. The, the local magistrates tried to remove him from office as being sort of the spiritual head over what was going on in Munster, but he was too popular. Now in this time, two immigrants from Holland became important. One of them was named John Matthies, and another one was named John of Leiden. Matthies was a tall, powerful man of commanding appearance. He believed that he was a prophet. And people believed that he was a prophet. He was one of those fanatics who was capable of going to any extreme and all the more dangerous because he was utterly sincere. This was a Dutch guy, originally influenced by this guy, Melchior Hoffman, that I mentioned to you before, that died in prison. But he came to uh, Munster when Bernard Rothman was spiritually overseeing the city and it was a Protestant city. Matthies was a very powerful personality, and he obtained control over the city council. And he wanted to enact such vigorous laws in the city of Munster that basically said no unbaptized person would be allowed in the city. Now when he said unbaptized, he meant unbaptized as an adult. So in other words, it would be basically a city or a little kingdom of Anabaptists. And so that's what he said. He said, we're going to do this. All people in the city must be either baptized or you know, make this Anabaptist commitment or leave Munster or die. This was basically the program that he tried to enact. That baptism or exile was commanded. That community of goods was introduced. That observance of Sunday was abolished that the public celebration of the Lord's Supper was introduced, that Matthews took control of the distribution of food and other necessities, and that they sent messengers all over Europe to announce the coming millennium. Again, before, as part of the Melchiorites, uh, influenced by this guy Melchior Hoffman, they believed that the New Jerusalem was going to come down to Strasbourg. Well, I guess here, under Matthews, they believe, well, Strasbourg isn't the place, Munster is the place, and the kingdom of God is going to come to Munster. Now, when they sent messengers all around Europe to proclaim what they thought was this great news, all it did was tell Europe that something was seriously wrong in Munster. And Protestant and Roman Catholics came together to lay siege against this city, that had been taken over by this crazy Anabaptist leader. People within the city tried to resist. There was a shoemaker named Hubert, Hubert Ruscher who put himself at the head of a body of original citizens 
to protest against the foreigners taking over and making all these very vigorous laws. So a popular gathering was held in the cathedral where Matthes at once condemned this man Rusher to death. And this other guy, John of Leiden, claimed that he had a revelation from God right then and there that he should execute the sentence. And so he took out his sword, he hacked against the man, he didn't kill him, but he severely wounded him, and then the, the, the men had um, the, the guts to say that they were treated unjustly, and they barely escaped with their lives. Uh, although a few days later, uh, this one man who was particularly wounded was brought up again, and the execution was uh, held in order by Mathis, they executed him. Now as this happened, the bishop of the city gathered his own troops and others who were outraged by what was happening in Munster. They attacked the city and they held it under siege. Unexpectedly, one day, <coughs> Matthes left the city to join a force attacking those laying siege to the city, and he died in battle. And if you can believe it, when Matthes died in battle unexpectedly, he just sort of got on a horse and rode out to the armies and was killed in battle. When he died, that's when it really started getting weird, if it wasn't weird enough again. Because this left this guy, John of Leiden, in control of the city of Munster. So what did he start doing? Well, he claimed a prophecy to abolish, abolish the town council and replace them with his own 12 elders. He made new laws to make Munster what he called a new Israel. In July of 1534, he introduced polygamy. At first, it was resisted, but he argued for it strongly from the Old Testament examples and because there were much more women in the city than men. They passed a law that all young women had to be married and that all younger women had to be under the protection of a man's household. John of Leiden immediately married the very beautiful widow of Matthews, a woman again who was said to be very beautiful. All this started a civil war within the besieged city. So get the picture. Munster is surrounded outside its city walls by siege armies that want to overthrow the city. But inside the city, this guy, John of Leiden, who took over for the dead Matthews, John Matthews, this guy, John of Leiden, is taking over the city and causing a civil war within the besieged city. And the leadership of John of Leiden survived the civil war, but the polygamy law caused nothing but trouble, and it was abolished by the end of the year. John of Leiden had himself proclaimed as king, and he appointed a prophet to proclaim him the king of the whole earth, and they called Munster the New Zion. Um, they lived lavish lives while the city starved under the siege. The troops under the command of the bishop eventually overcame the city defenses. They went in through the walls. They slaughtered many of the citizens, including those who had surrendered and been promised mercy. When the kingdom of David fell in 1535, the half-starved survivors in the city were reduced to making soups from stuff that they could scrape from the walls. They were slaughtered mercilessly. Three of the ringleaders were tortured to death with red-hot pinchers, and their bodies were hoisted in cages at the steeple of St. Lambert's Church in Munster. It's a little hard to see on the thing, but there's three cages hanging there from the Munster, from the, from the steeple. They put the dead bodies of these Anabaptist leaders in those cages, and they left them up there until they rotted, and then they left the bones up there for hundreds and hundreds of years. Those cages are still up there from the church at St. Matthew's. Now, as you can imagine, this kind of craziness which was very much like a David Koresh, Branch Davidian kind of thing happening in Waco, Texas. This was its own version of it happening hundreds of years before in the city of Munster. But this aberration at Munster almost killed the entire Anabaptist movement because it sort of justified every kind of persecution against them. You see, the Anabaptists were always being criticized as being crazy fanatics who would do anything crazy, and who knows how violent and antisocial they are. 
This debacle at Munster made it all seem like the truth. And so now every group that was outside of the institutional state church was stained with the shame of Munster. They believe now everybody outside the state church could be effectively branded as a dangerous revolutionary. Well, then what happened to the Anabaptists after Munster? Well, I would say that God used a man named Menno Simmons to rebuild the movement. You see, nobody tied this diverse collection of churches together. There was no one Anabaptist pope, so to speak, over all these different eclectic Anabaptist groups. No one leader. But perhaps the best known Anabaptist after Munster was a guy named Menno Simmons, who gave his name to the Mennonites. The Mennonites come from Menno Simmons and the congregation he established. I, I like what Menno Simmons said here. He said, no one can truly charge me with agreeing with the Munster teaching. On the contrary, for 17 years until the present day, I have opposed and striven against it privately and publicly by voice and pen. Those who, like the Munster people, refuse the cross of Christ, despise the Lord's will, and practice earthly, earthly lusts under the pretense of doing right, we will never acknowledge as our brethren and sisters. Now again, this is also shows us one of the reasons why, after the Munster debacle, why so many Anabaptist groups were firmly committed to pacifism and not fighting in wars. Because they wanted to stress the principle, we are nonviolent. We are not like those crazies at Munster who did what they did. Now, of course, there were still some bizarre groups that called themselves by the name Anabaptists, and they were still persecuted by both Roman Catholics and Protestants. But nevertheless, there still remained a very godly core to the general Anabaptist movement. Another example of this very godly core was a man named Jacob Hutter. In the year 1536, he was arrested because his church was not approved by the state, and they tortured him to find out where the other illegal believers were. One torture that they applied to Jacob Hutter was to sink him in icy water until his skin cracked open, and then they poured alcohol into the open wounds and lit it on fire. Throughout torture like this, he remained absolutely silent and did not inform on any of his brothers and sisters. So eventually, they burned him at the stake. His wife escaped, but was later captured and also executed. Now, it wasn't until developments that we're going to talk about next that Europeans decided to just leave these godly Anabaptist people alone. They were tolerated as being the quiet people in the country. And they mostly settled in isolated mountain valleys and rural areas, and they left their homelands to live in sparsely populated areas or overseas. Now again, these Hutterites, these people who followed, who fled persecution wherever they could, just incredible examples of godliness. And so much of what we take for granted in the church, adult baptism, the separation of the church from the government, the, the idea that the government shouldn't dictate to the church what we should do, that the church should just be a freely chosen association of believers. These things we take for granted, but they were radical innovations in their day introduced by these Anabaptists. I have to say that in many ways, Though I feel we owe a great deal to the Reformers, though I feel that we owe a great deal to guys like Luther and Zwingli and Calvin, we really do. In a lot of ways, I feel that our spiritual heritage, or I'll just speak for myself, my spiritual heritage is in some ways more connected with these Anabaptists, as despised and persecuted as they were, as they are with the magisterial church leaders. Well... This was one response to the Reformation of Luther and Calvin and the rest, these radical reforms. But there were other important responses to the Reformation, and one of them was under the Roman Catholic idea of the Counter-Reformation. 
The Counter-Reformation, or sometimes called the Roman Catholic Reformation, was a strong reaffirmation of the doctrine and structure of the Roman Catholic Church, which climaxed at the Council of Trent. It was pretty much a reaction against Protestantism and the growth of Protestantism. You see, you have to admit, when the Roman Catholic Church was so shaken by the Protestant Revolution, they did a lot of soul-searching. They did a lot of self-examination and said, what is it about us that's so messed up that this great reformation has happened? And so they had the Council of Trent. But you see, even before Martin Luther posted his 95 Theses in 1517, there was already stirrings of internal reform within the Roman Church. The crisis of the Reformation made them take on this challenge of reform, but they were very careful to try to do it on their own terms. They did not want the Protestants telling them how to reform their own church. They were going to do it themselves. In one way, the Counter-Reformation or the Roman Catholic Reformation was a retaliation against Protestantism. It was trying to win back some or all of those who had been lost to the Protestant cause. It was a way of saying, look, you don't have to leave our church, we will reform ourselves and make ourselves better. But in another way, the Roman Catholic Reformation was a true reform of the church, trying to correct some obvious problems. Now the man who was Pope, when Martin Luther started his Reformation in 1517, was a man named Leo X. Leo was a classical Renaissance Pope, elegant, worldly, sophisticated, intelligent, but consumed with political and family ambition much more than with the spiritual welfare of his people. Um, he spent a lot of time and money on the arts and on gambling. It's said that when Leo X saw a copy of Luther's Theses in, in 1518, he made two comments. He said, first, Luther is a drunken German. He'll feel different when he's sober. Secondly, he said, Friar Martin is a brilliant fellow. The whole argument is due to envy among the monks. And that was the general attitude. So they just regarded it as a fight between different monastic orders. And the Pope and the administration of the Vatican in general did not think very much of the Germans. They thought of the Italians as being the one with high culture and intelligence and education, and the Germans to be very much a lower sort of people. And so they just didn't think that it would be a very significant thing that Luther started. But they soon had to react to it, because as the Reformation of Martin Luther swept across land, it threatened the Catholic Church in a very severe way. Uh, People and leaders that once belonged to the Roman Catholic Church were now Protestants. Churches and land and income that once belonged to the Roman Catholic Church was now in the hands of Protestants. It made a very big difference. And so what they did was establishing this whole um, counter-reformation was to establish something called the Oratory of Divine Love. This was a society of influential Roman Catholic leaders that were committed to improving the spiritual condition of the church. We'll talk a little bit more about it later. But they also decided that they were going to reform the institution of the papacy to make it less political, less social, and, and more spiritual. They founded the Society of Jesus, known as the Jesuits, and uh, the Jesuits were a very important thing that we'll talk about in a moment. They founded several new monastic orders. They held the Council of Trent. They had a rejuvenation and a reorganization of the Inquisition. They furthered the index of forbidden books. And it ended with some very severe wars of religion. Now each of these helped to revitalize the Roman Catholic Church so that by the year of 1650, you could say that the Roman Catholic Church was really sort of revitalized and doing its thing in Europe once again. The Oratory of Divine Love was, as I said before, led by this important leader named Gasparo Contranini, and he was an influential Roman Catholic leader 
who gathered other influential Roman Catholic leaders who said, we need essentially a spiritual revival in the Roman Catholic Church. So he worked hard to reform the Roman Catholic Church from within and to heal the division within uh, or with the Protestants. He became a papal delegate. Uh, they, they tried to work out compromises with the Protestants, but it didn't work. Uh, Luther absolutely refused to accept the compromise formulas that tried to heal the breach between Catholics and Protestants. And, and this failure to reach the agreements opened the way for more strict and militant Roman Catholics to take a harder line against the Protestants. Then there was the reform of the papacy. After Leo X, there came three popes who were very interested in changing the way that things were done in the papal office. These would be Clement VII, Paul III, and Paul VI. They had a lot of very difficult questions to deal with, such as, what are we going to do about the Protestants? Secondly, what do we do about the complicated political situation in Europe? This division between Roman Catholic and Protestant made for a very complicated political landscape in Europe. For example, fellow Roman Catholic rulers might still be rivals and enemies. Right? They're both Roman Catholics, but one of them is enemy. It was a very easy temptation for one of them to go Protestant, to turn the force against one another. And so they also asked, what do we do about corruption in the church? The Roman Catholic Church was so deeply corrupt with people who benefited by the corruption that there were a lot of people in the institutional bureaucracy of the Roman Catholic Church who had an interest in resisting changes. Well, the first pope, Clement VII, didn't do very much. He was caught between kings. But yet, further, further um, uh, popes did more. But yet, you've got to understand that these guys had to do it all in the midst of intense political pressure. For an example of the political pressure, take a look at Clement VII. He was the pope on the throne of the pope when um, Henry VIII wanted to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon. Actually, Henry didn't ask for a divorce, he asked for an annulment. Because divorce is supposedly forbidden or only specially granted in the Roman Catholic Church, oftentimes people will ask for an annulment before they ask for a divorce. And so the, arrest, the, the request for an annulment came to Clement in Rome, but when he got the request, Rome was surrounded by the armies of Charles V, who was the cousin, or excuse me, the nephew of Catherine of Aragon, the wife that King Henry VIII wanted to depose. The Pope didn't feel that he had the freedom to make Charles V so angry with his armies surrounding the city of Rome, and so he was in no position to grant the annulment. But this was something that set in motion the English Reformation. Again, complicated political scenarios. Now Clement's successor, Paul III, was an energetic and effective reformer. He mostly made administrative changes and called councils and had reform-minded cardinals promoted and made, followed their recommendations. These cardinals brought an official report to the Pope in 1537 that analyzed the causes of low spiritual condition and recommended immediate action. They said, let's throw out the most corrupt people and let's promote the good people. There was a lot to deal with. There was a lot of bribery. There were a lot of abuses of papal power. There was the evasion of church law by clergy and people alike. The abuse of indulgences. A huge number of prostitutes working in Rome. But perhaps the most important thing that Paul III did was he called together the Council of Trent. Trent was the most important council of the Roman Catholic Church between Nicaea in 325 and Vatican II that started in 1962. The Protestants were invited to attend, but they were not allowed to have any voice or vote in the proceedings. So many important things were established or re-established at the Council of Trent. They re-established at the Council of Trent salvation by faith and works. They restated and re 
affirmed transubstantiation. They reaffirmed the Mass as it is understood by the medieval church. <coughs> they reaffirmed the seven sacraments, the celibacy of the clergy, and the existence of purgatory and the doctrine of adulteries. Basically, the Roman Catholic Church did not make a lot of changes at the Council of Trent, but they reaffirmed and reasserted most of the doctrines of the late medieval Roman Catholic Church. In addition, the Pope left the Council of Trent with more power because he was given the authority to enforce the decrees of the Council and the Church officials had to promise obedience to the Pope on all of these changes. Now the Council of Trent, in perhaps its most dramatic section, not only affirmed all of these doctrines and practices, but it explicitly pronounced curses, anathemas, on anyone who disagreed with them. The Protestants who attended and learned of what happened at the Council of Trent were bitterly disappointed because they were hoping that there would be some real reform movements at the Council of Trent, but there were none. I would say that the Protestants were disappointed, but not surprised. A next aspect affecting the Roman Catholic response to the Reformation was the founding of the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits. Now present at the Council of Trent were two sharp members of a new monastic order that Pope Paul III had approved in 1540. The Society of Jesus was the name of this new monastic order, and it became known as the Jesuits. The founder and leader of this movement was a man named Ignatius of Loyola, who in some ways became the symbol of the Roman Catholic Counter-Reformation. Loyola is a very interesting man. He was a soldier whose career was cut short by a very serious wound. He reflected upon his life while he was convalescing from his wound, and he committed himself to be a soldier again, but this time a soldier of Jesus Christ. And he decided he was going to take the same dedication that a medieval knight would swear to his Lord, his human Lord, and he was going to take that same rigor and discipline and devotion and give it to Jesus Christ. So Loyola came out from his convalescence as a wounded soldier, being a curious mix of a mystic, a monk, and a soldier. He wrote all about it in a very influential book called The Spiritual Exercises. And he gathered around him a group of men dedicated to the same vision, and he founded the Society of Jesus. These people considered themselves to be the spiritual elite of Roman Catholicism. Fiercely devoted and loyal to the Pope with a military style of devotion and with the attitude that the ends justify the means. The movement grew very quickly. By the time Loyola died in 1556, there were members of the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits in Japan, Brazil, Ethiopia, the coast of Central Africa, and in nearly every country of Europe. By 1556, his half-dozen followers had grown to more than 1,500 members of this monastic order, the Jesuits. Another aspect was the rejuvenation and the reorganization of the Inquisition. Basically, the Inquisition dealt with heresy as a crime, as it being the worst of crimes. And so it commonly used torture and terror to obtain confessions, and if its victims were found guilty, they were turned over to the state for execution. In places where the Inquisition had popular support, such as in Spain and Italy, not so much France and England, the Inquisition didn't have much popular support at all in France or England. The Inquisition was an effective tool against Protestant, Protestantism. They used terror and violence within Spain and within Italy to keep Protestantism out. I mean, you have to consider this. That there were several countries that were virtually untouched by the Reformation, right? Spain was one of them. Italy was one of them. Large portions of France were untouched by the Reformation. Large portions of Ireland were untouched by the Reformation. Why? 
Well, a lot of it was because of the hard work of these priests, but also the violence and terror that they would use in keeping Protestantism out. There was also, again, the Index of Forbidden Books. This was something that was started in the Middle Ages, but the practice was strengthened and increased under Pope, Pi Pope Paul IV in 1559. A second list of forbidden books in 1564 effectively censored three quarters of all the printed books in Europe at that time. The index was maintained by the Roman Catholic Church until the year 1966. Then finally, you see on this list some results of the Counter-Reformation. There were some intense wars of religion. And the most notable of these wars of religion is a very ugly, complicated war known as the Thirty Years' War, which curiously lasted 30 years, from 1618 to 1648. Now, I want you to notice, this is a full century after Martin Luther began the Reformation in 1517. So for a hundred years after the Reformation, they were still trying to sort out what Europe would be. Would Europe be Catholic? Would Europe be Protestant? Would it be a mixture of the both? What lands would be Catholic? What lands would be Protestant? These were unanswered questions for a hundred years in the conflict that continued back and forth after the Reformation. But a hundred years after the Reformation, there finally started a radical war meant originally by the Roman Catholics to sweep Protestantism from Europe and to retake Europe for the Roman Catholic cause. Please understand, though it turned out to be an incredibly complicated political affair, the original impulses behind the Thirty Years' War were effectively an attempt to reconquer Protestant Europe for the Roman Catholic Church by use of military means. It was principally fought on the territory that is today Germany, but it also involved most of the major European powers. It occurred for a number of reasons. Basically, as I said, it was caused by Roman Catholic kings and princes that wanted to push back Protestantism by force. This war left Germany culturally, politically, economically, and spiritually devastated. There was only one principality in all of Germany, the Principality of Brandenburg, that escaped untouched from this terrible Thirty Years' War. And ironically, when it was all over, the war that basically was fought in this ugly, ugly place over 30 years and, and visited incredible death and destruction upon Europe, when it was all over, the political situation was basically the same as when it began. <coughs> um, re religious tensions were growing throughout the second half of the 16th century. Uh, some peace concords that they had signed were sort of unraveling. And then the major periods of the Thirty Years' War could basically be divided into these four major periods. The Bohemian Revolt, the Danish Intervention, the Swedish Intervention, and then the Swiss, the Swedish French Intervention. If there were any heroes to come out from the Thirty Years' War, it would have been one, this man Gustav Adolphus of Sweden. He was also known as Gustav Adolf the Great, and um, he was a remarkable military leader who was the king of Sweden from 1611 until his death. Um, he was one of the most m prominent and major players in the Thirty Years' War. Uh, he landed with his armies in what is today Germany. Germany back there was called Pomerania. In 1630, he landed with his armies then, and on July 6, he came into Germany proper and then by September of 1631, he was fighting his first battles. Through a mix of brilliant military wisdom, tactics, strategy, he fought battles all over what is today modern-day Germany, and him and the Swedish army behind him 
basically defeated the Roman Catholic armies all over the place. Sadly, in November of 1632, at the Battle of Lutzen, Gustav Adolphus was killed, but the Swedes won the battle and they defeated Wallenstein. The Swedish war effort was kept up by French generals and other people, and essentially they uh, changed the landscape and protected Europe from becoming uh, a Roman Catholic continent once again. Gustav Adolphus was a brilliant military commander, admired by later generals such as Klaus, uh, Karl von Clausewitz, and Napoleon Bonaparte, and they idolized him as a general above all others. His contribution to the Thirty Year War essentially prevented a Roman Catholic victory, and the war ended with the kind of stalemate that was previously described. So basically, Europe fought this devastating religious war, and when it was all over, they basically went back to the lines that they had before and decided that they would observe the principle that the religion of the prince determined the religion of the area where he ruled. In other words, if you were a Protestant prince, then your principality, your domain, would be a Protestant land. If you were Roman Catholic, then it would be a Roman Catholic land. But the devastation caused by the war has been a long source of controversy among historians. There are estimates of casualties among the civilian population of up to 30% of the German population. 30% might be high, but it was at least somewhere around 15 to 20% of the population that died because of the battles, because of the famine, and because of disease. You have to think about it. That's like a plague visited upon Europe, especially upon Germany. 15 to 20 percent of the population dead. And much of the destruction of the civilian lives and property was caused by the greed and the cruelty of the mercenary soldiers. This war caused serious dislocation to both the economic and population of Central Europe, and it may have done more than anything else to change things into a more modern world. You see, the war had some very powerful consequences. Probably the most radical consequence is by the year 1648, when the Peace of Westphalia was signed. By the way, interestingly, the Peace of Westphalia that ended the Thirty Years' War was signed, of all places, in the city of Munster. <laughs> the same place where a few decades before you had this crazy, radical Anabaptist revolution. But in the city of Munster, they signed the Peace of Westphalia. And basically, what this determined was that Europe was sick of religious conflicts. This was the last major religious war in Europe, ending in 1648. But secondly, the destruction caused by mercenary armies in this period almost defied, defied description. The war did a lot to end the age of mercenary armies in Europe. It, it began with the use of these country knights, but then it ushered in the age of well-disciplined national armies, replacing the mercenary armies, because people saw what great destruction the mercenary armies made upon Europe. Now this is what I want you to get in your mind from this period. At the end of the Thirty Years' War, there was a rough accommodation between Protestant and Catholic peoples in Europe. They didn't like each other, they didn't agree with each other, but they agreed basically to stop fighting wars against one another. This was a huge step into a more modern world that we're going to discuss in our next lectures, how Christianity emerged in this more modern world after these issues were sort of settled in Europe between Protestants and Roman Catholics.